Electrolytic Cell is going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OET prep as well. I'll leave a link in the description for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year. So if you'd like to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so these last two lessons are going to deal with electrolytic cells and electrolysis. So in the first one here, we're going to kind of take a look qualitative look at these electrolytic cells. So, and in the second one, we're gonna take a quantitative look. We're gonna learn how to predict how much of the products you might create and things of this sort. And it's gonna be a little bit of a pain in the butt. If you had a little bit of second semester physics, it'll be a little easier, um, but uh, we'll summarize it pretty nicely for you in that next lesson anyway. So, but the qualitative look here, instead of calculating how much products, we're gonna be largely predicting how to, uh, largely learning how to predict the products. And so it turns out there's two types of electrolysis. There's molten electrolysis and aqueous electrolysis. And the big deal is to do electrolysis, you need the cations and anions to be able to be mobile. They need to be able to move around. And that's not possible in a solid ionic compound. So, but it is possible if you, possible if you melt it, make it a liquid, or if you dissolve it in water, assuming it is a soluble ionic compound. So those are your two options. Either you melt it, and that's molten electrolysis, or you dissolve it in water, and that's aqueous electrolysis. And the big difference between the two uh, is do you have water present? Aqueous electrolysis, yes. Molten electrolysis, no. So we'll find out that's a pretty big difference. Now, molten electrolysis is only gonna take place at elevated temperatures generally because ionic compounds have very high melting points normally. So that's why they call it molten electrolysis. In fact, the other time you hear that word molten is molten lava. And if you look, molten lava is just melted rock and rocks often are composed of a fair amount of ionic compounds. And that's why it takes a, you know pretty high temperatures to melt rock. Well, same thing here, melting ionic compounds in general take super high temperatures, and when you melt it, you've got a molten salt in that case. Now, we've got a cation, we've got an anion, and in this case, the cation is in the plus one oxidation state, the anion is in the minus one oxidation state. And so for the cation, you're starting off with sodium plus one, and for the anion, you're starting off with bromine minus one. I just wanna point out that we already have, you know, elements in their ionic forms, and cations and anions in form of charge. Well, in electrolysis, most of the time you're gonna be producing elements in one way, shape, or form. And so in this case, what, what element can you turn Na plus one into? Well, you can turn it into Na. And to do that, you've gotta gain an electron to turn it into Na. And in this case, your cation is getting reduced so to its elemental form. And where does reduction take place? At the cathode. So on the other hand, your anion, Br minus, to turn it into its elemental form. So you're gonna need two of these first off. So, but in this case, it's losing two electrons to get up into the zero oxidation state. And that's oxidation and that takes place at the anode. But this is really convenient for memorizing it because the cation gets reduced at the cathode, the anion gets oxidized at the anode, makes it easy to remember. And so predicting the products for molten electrolysis of a binary salt, really easy. If you've got NaBr, well then you're going to make Na and Br. In this case, diatomic bromine is its elemental form, so Br2. So but you're just going to make those elemental forms. And the cation is going to get reduced at the cathode, to form its elemental form, and the anion's gonna get oxidized at the anode into its elemental form, and that's it. There's no more guesswork than that. Predicting the products is super straightforward for molten electrolysis. Now, this is a little more pain in the butt in practice to do because you've gotta you know, heat it up to super elevated temperatures. Whereas aqueous electrolysis, in practice, well, as long as it dissolves in water, you can do this at room temperature. But predicting the products that we're gonna find out is a much more pain in the butt. So uh, this one's easier in practice, I'm sorry, more difficult in practice, but easier to predict the products on paper. This one's easier to do in practice, but more difficult to predict the products in, uh, on paper, as we'll see here. So a little bit of a pain in the butt. Now, we've got some options here. It turns out that sodium ions, there is still a chance that they're gonna get reduced at the cathode, and there is still a chance that bromide ions are gonna get oxidized at the anode. Those are still possibilities. But with aqueous electrolysis, we now have water. And the problem is that water can also get oxidized and reduced. And that's gonna be a possibility. And we find out in aqueous electrolysis, you're only gonna get one reduction reaction happening at the cathode and one oxidation reaction happening at the anode. And now your job is to figure out which one. 
Well, if you take a look at water, hydrogen's in the plus one oxidation state, oxygen's in the minus two oxidation state. And in similar fashion, so when you do the reduction, the hydrogen, which is in the plus one oxidation state, goes to its elemental form in that reduction process. And so here's your other option at the cathode. You got two H2O plus two electrons going to H2 plus two OH minus. And if we take a look at the values right off the table there, we got negative 2.71 volts versus negative 0.83 volts. Now we learned that our electrolytic cells are non-spontaneous reactions. They have positive values for delta G, which we're largely not gonna look at in this lesson, but they have negative E cells. And so your goal though, is you wanna put in as little voltage as possible to make your electrolysis reaction happen. So uh, again, it's not gonna overall be a spontaneous reaction, but you want it to be as least non-spontaneous as possible. And the way you're gonna achieve that is you're gonna pick the highest Reduction, uh, reduction potential possible for the cathode. And when I say highest, that could mean most positive, but most of the time it's gonna mean least negative. So which one of these is technically higher? Well, you got negative 2.71, very negative down here, negative 0.83, not so negative, and then you have zero, and then you'd have positive numbers if they were options, but they're not in this case. And so in this case, it turns out the only half reaction that's going to occur at the cathode is this guy because it's the easier reaction of the two. Well, now we got some problems at the anode. The anode's a little bit of a pain in the butt because what takes place at the anode? Oxidation. What are you typically given a table of? Reduction potentials. So if we take a look at the reduction potentials I've provided, well, I've given you the one for bromine here, but again, for bromine, we're not doing reduction. We're doing oxidation. We're not starting off with Br2. We're starting off with Br-. We have to be able to do this reaction in reverse. And so for this oxidation, the oxidation potential is not positive 1.07 volts. It is negative 1.07 volts. All right. Now, we also said that water, in addition to be able to get reduced, water can also get oxidized. And so if we take a look for the, the oxidation of water, again, these are written as reductions. So if I want to find the oxidation of water, I need to have a reaction or half reaction that starts with water going the other direction. And that is this one right here. And a lot of students have trouble identifying that from a table of reduction potentials. But we're going to be doing this reaction in reverse as a possibility. And so let's write that backwards. We got two H2O going to O2 plus four H plus plus four electrons. And again, if we reverse the reaction, that changes the sign, so that's gonna be negative 1.23 volts. And so if we take a look at our two oxidation half reactions that are possible, and again, only one is gonna happen, whichever one is easier, whichever one is closer to being spontaneous, or again, most positive is really the way to look at it, the highest. And most positive means also less negative, as is the comparison here. So most of the time, that's what it's really gonna come down to for electrolysis is less negative. Although you will find certain salts that might have the possibility of having one of the half reactions have a positive value. And if that's the case, great. But most of the time, it really is gonna come down to less negative. And so at the anode, we'll be oxidizing the bromide ion. And so in this case, at the cathode, no sodium metal is going to get produced. Notice when we did molten electrolysis, it produced sodium metal at the cathode and elemental bromine at the anode. Well, we're still going to be able to produce some elemental bromine at the anode, but we're not going to produce any sodium metal at the cathode because we have an easier possibility. The reduction of water leads to the production of H2 and OH-, minus, which was considerably easier to do. It took less uh, energy to accomplish that. And if we wanted to now, we could take and add our reduction potential at the cathode and our oxidation potential at the anode and find out that the overall cell potential is gonna be negative 1.90 volts in this case. So, and that is definitely a non-spontaneous reaction. And what this means, we, we talked about electrolysis uh, when we talked about galvanic cells, that we need a, a power source. And what this means is that your power source has to be able to supply minimum 1.90 volts for this reaction to occur. This reaction is non-spontaneous, so, and it's non-spontaneous by negative 1.90 volts, your power source has to overcome this. Minimum positive 1.90 volt power source needed, whether that's a battery, whether you plug that into a wall, whatever, but it's gotta be minimum 1.90 volts. So if you took like a AA battery, so, and if you had 
this aqueous salt in one molar concentration, so it's under standard conditions. If you were able to plug it into a AA battery, it's not gonna work. AA battery supplies 1.5 volts. We needed minimum 1.9 volts, but if you took two AA batteries and hooked them up in series, you'd now have the equivalent of a three volt battery, and now that would work. So, and even with the over voltage though, you're still just gonna get one reduction happening at the cathode, one oxidation happening at the anode, whichever of the two is easier in both cases. So the cation could have got reduced at the cathode or water could get reduced at the cathode and water was easier. The anion could get oxidized at the anode or water could get oxidized at the anode. In this case, it was the anion that was easier and that's how this works in predicting your products. All right, so now that we've learned how to predict the products, of electrolysis, both molten and aqueous electrolysis. In the next lesson, we're gonna predict how much of a product is created over time in one of these electrolysis reactions. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment let me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for general chemistry practice, if you're looking for final exam rapid reviews or practice final exams, then take a look at my general chemistry master course. Free trial is available. I'll leave a link in the description. Happy studying.